Unquestionably, the biggest misunderstanding in RC crawling is anti-squat, as evidenced by the number of people running link risers. In this video, I will explain exactly what anti-squat is, how to calculate it, and what it means on your rig. This is the definitive guide to anti-squat on RC crawlers. On this channel, we look at the science behind our grown-up toys. If you think a link riser is helping you slow creep up a steep incline and holding your front end down, you might be surprised after this video. I've published multiple follow-up videos that demonstrate the concept in real life. Anti-squat is a dynamic response to a dynamic acceleration event. One way to look at anti-squat is it can be thought of as an internal countermeasure of force. The rear four-bar linkage can be configured to counteract internal forces from acceleration that want to upset the chassis attitude. This is done by deploying a proportional counterforce that compresses or extends the rear shocks in opposition to the weight shift coming from rapid acceleration. This is the standard calculation diagram for driveshaft powered vehicles. It can be represented mathematically, but it's much easier just to draw the diagram. The variables are the front and rear contact patches, the center of gravity height, the fore aft location is not used, and imaginary lines drawn through the links, where they attach to the rear axle, where they attach to the chassis, and imaginary lines that intersect to create what's called the instant center. This diagram shows you the theoretical 100% anti-squat line, and you compare that to the actual calculated anti-squat response from your particular vehicle. Notice that there are no force values or acceleration values in the calculation. We will explain that later. You can also use software and a good picture of your rig to calculate anti-squat. I highly recommend some software called Bike Checker or Linkage, you can get a consumer hobby version for just $25. It's designed for bicycles, but it's super easy to adapt for RC car suspension. There are quite a few resources available to explain how to calculate anti-squat, as well as its inverse anti-dive and its sideways cousin anti-roll. No disrespect intended, but I think that the diagram on Crawlopedia is incorrect. At least I've never seen it drawn that way. The key words that need emphasis in any anti-squat discussion are acceleration and dynamic weight shift. And every dissertation uses those words for a reason. Every dissertation on the subject uses the word acceleration. And there is a reason for that. Anti-squat is a dynamic response to acceleration. And that acceleration is a horizontal acceleration sufficient to cause weight shift of the chassis relative to the wheels. There's no such thing as micro acceleration. We aren't talking about random or invisible accelerations. We're talking about one type of acceleration scenario. That is a horizontal acceleration where your wheels shoot out from underneath the chassis and the weight of the chassis lags behind momentarily. If this is how you drive, anti-squat is important. If this is how you drive, anti-squat is not important. He's crawling from the driver's seat. Slow and controlled. The question I will answer is, can a rear suspension linkage, specifically link risers, be used to push your front end down on steep climbs? First, we need to understand acceleration. But before that, let's understand velocity. Flashback to high school physics. Velocity is a change in position over time. Imagine cruising down the highway at a constant 60 miles an hour. Velocity is a change in distance over time. The units are meters per second, miles per hour, etc. Just as velocity is a change in position, acceleration is a change in velocity. Picture faster and faster and faster. Acceleration is a change in velocity over time. 
You can also think of it as a change in distance over time, over time again. The units of acceleration end up with time being squared. For example, meters per second squared. If velocity is constant, then acceleration is zero. Remember, acceleration is a change in velocity. No change, no acceleration. No acceleration, no anti-squat possible. Here are some real life examples. Here are some older cars with unknown or questionable anti-squad. Notice how the front wheel lifts under acceleration. Here are some newer cars where the anti-squat response has almost certainly been designed into the car. Notice how the chassis stays level. There must be acceleration to induce an inertial force on the chassis and create this dynamic weight shift. It's not a static situation. If you are slow creeping up a steep, that's not dynamic. It certainly isn't dynamic enough to cause this weight shift. Yes, your weight shifts to the rear wheels from the steepness of the incline, but that's not dynamic. Here is another analogy with a balance style scale. Imagine standing on a balance scale. Now jump on the scale. What happens? The scale moves from the force of the falling inertia or kinetic energy. Now imagine a scenario where you jump, but the scale somehow doesn't move. Anti-squat balances the force from the jump to counteract the inertia. The anti-squat force is momentarily added to offset the jump. Anti-squat is a dynamic proportional force that offsets the jump force until the jump force dissipates and returns to a static state. Now, let's look at how that weight shift affects the driver and chassis, also known as sprung weight. Sprung weight is all the mass above the shocks, plus about half the weight of the shocks, drive shafts, and links. Unsprung weight is all the mass below the shocks, wheels, axles, and the other half of the weight of the shocks, links, and drive shafts. Newton's first law, an object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by a net external force. As the wheels accelerate forward, the sprung weight lags behind momentarily because it's floating on springs. This weight shift pushes the chassis down and back, compressing the rear shocks. 100% anti-squat holds the chassis level by adding an internal counterforce to the rear shocks. At exactly 100% anti-squat, the chassis will remain level. This is true for any level of acceleration. Remember, an acceleration value was not a variable in the calculation formula. I want to be careful in saying that because people will often believe that very small accelerations exist. We are talking about a sufficient acceleration to cause this weight shift. This means at least enough acceleration to overcome shock friction and spring rate. If you have less than 100% anti-squat, then the rear shocks will compress. If anti-squat is greater than 100%, then the rear shocks will extend. This is also called pro-squat. Here is the balance analogy in crawler terms. Your static mass is balanced with your shock spring rate at ride height. When an acceleration force appears, anti-squat deploys an opposite and equal counter force, so the scale doesn't move. The chassis doesn't tip, it stays level. Let me briefly mention anti-dive and anti-roll or roll center. Anti-dive is simply the reverse of anti-squat. Under heavy braking and deceleration, the chassis wants to compress the front suspension. Anti-dive geometry is effectuated from the front and maintains the chassis attitude. Roll center is the same principle, only sideways. You cannot improve slow side hilling by changing your roll center because it's also a dynamic response to fast cornering with sideways acceleration. Here are a couple other things to consider. If you run full droop in the rear, there is no travel left for anti-squat to resist. 
you can't squat any further. I should point out that full droop in RC crawler circles means full shock compression. Not exactly sure that happened, but in most other industries, full droop means full extension of the shocks. The wheel cannot fall away from the car any further than what it is now. Also, when your rig is pointed uphill, the rear shocks may be fully compressed from the angle of the hill. Even if you're accelerating in this scenario, anti-squat cannot do anything. Rear torque is another very simple principle of physics that tends to confound people. This is a typical weight bias on a high-end crawler, 60-40. Newton's third law, for every action or force, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The rear axle housing rotates opposite and equal to the rotation of the wheels. Rear torque unweights the front end. That is the only reaction possible. Eventually you will wheelie and possibly even flip over backwards. There is simply no rear suspension linkage that can change this. Pushing the front end down is simply impossible. This can also be expressed as a moment balance. A moment is a force times length. Here's the math if you're interested. You can figure out exactly at what point your front end will lift off the ground with some simple calculations. As you can see, there are simply no physical mechanisms that push the front end down. The front can only be pulled upwards. Now this is where many people in the RC crawler world are gonna get their hearts broken. Can a link riser hold the front end down? By now you should know the answer is no. The rotational loads from the drive torque within the rear axle housing transfer loads to the chassis through the links. In most cases, the rear axle will push and pull on the links. You can separate the links at the chassis and the force directions will not change. You can separate the links at the axle by adding a link riser and the force directions and magnitudes also stay the same. I've even heard someone say to crisscross applesauce the links to prove that your front end can be pushed down. If you do this, you will simply lock out your suspension movement. Try it with some Legos and you'll see. This analogy does not hold. If both links are above the rear axle, like this, perhaps on a portal axle, then they will pull on both links, which still lifts the front end. None of these scenarios can reverse the forces and physically push the front end down. If you're still not convinced, here are three other factors that will negate anti-squat. First of all, front overdrive. Overdrive will stretch your wheelbase on a high traction surface. It's like driving with the rear brakes applied and the rear wheels are dragged. The result is the rear shocks compress. This is easy to see. Drive at a constant medium speed on flat pavement and your shocks will likely compress. I've got a video that demonstrates this. The second thing is super light unsprung weight that is so common on RC crawlers. Typical unsprung weights on full-size vehicles are over 80%. Contrast that to RC crawlers that should have less than 20% sprung weight when they are set up optimally. The sprung weight on a typical RC crawler is very light. Because of this, there is very low inertia or low potential energy that's available to squat the rear suspension. Remember, it's a dynamic weight shift. You need really high acceleration to create this substantial weight shift with such light sprung weight. Having a low sprung weight requires even more acceleration and inertia. Thirdly, loss of traction or braking traction. Don't confuse that with braking traction. Ask yourself this, can you pop a wheelie on a frozen lake? Ever see a drift car or a rally car wheelie? It's because the wheels are spinning. Bouncing, overdrive, and wheel spin all eliminate or reduce anti-squat. So if your wheels are spinning up a climb, there is no anti-squat effect. Also, overdrive typically breaks rear traction, which works doubly against anti-squat. Not only does it stretch your wheelbase and compress your shocks, your rear wheels are also slipping. I have a video that demonstrates this. Now let's look at some real life geometry. This is a pretty typical high clearance, forward bias, 2.2 cheetah rig. Know your weight balance. In this case, it was 63.37. 
The CG height can be measured using this left-right rocking method. The reason I suggest you go through this exercise is your crawler's actual anti-squat may be surprising. You could very well already have more than 100% anti-squat. Even if adding anti-squat did help, which it doesn't, you should at least know where your vehicle sits before indiscriminately changing the geometry or adding a link riser. Don't just assume more is better. A link riser might only change it from 120% to 130% and that wouldn't even make a difference because you're already well into the pro squat realm. And if I haven't made it clear by now, don't add a link riser under any circumstance. And I hope I've given you at least nine reasons why it's not supported by physics. Here are a few pro tips that will actually help you climb. Add or move weight down. Add or move weight forward. Down is better, which I demonstrate in this video, but forward helps too. This weight placement on a superclass rig should be making sense. Weight is down and forward. Reduce your total weight. This improves your fight against gravity and assumes you still have enough downforce to generate traction. Softer front springs. The front shock springs are a counterclockwise force unweighting the front end with less gravity acting to compress them. Go softer and softer in the front to reduce the front end lifting up. If you've gone all the way soft, the next step is to take off your springs altogether. Yes, that's okay. The next step after that is negative springs, sometimes known as hair bands or the pen spring mod, which are amazing on crawlers if your focus is verticality and you know how to set them up. And I do have a video for that. Finally, larger rear wheels move the fulcrum away from the slope, improving your balance point. Here's the math supporting that. If you want to review it, probably not. So why do so many people embrace link risers? I suspect it's a couple of things. First of all, a psychology concept called confirmation bias, which is in the same vein as the placebo effect. Someone you trust told you a link riser would improve your performance. And you're thinking more anti-squat must be better. You wanted to believe that. You went and tested and sure enough, it did exactly what you hoped for. That's confirmation bias, looking for proof that something you believe is going to work. In reality, you probably just drove better. The other thing is that people don't generally test with a high level of scientific rigor, and there's nothing wrong with that. Very few people have the time and energy and interest to really prove something out scientifically. We all just want to drive. I get that. Let's say you drive on Monday, you make a couple mods, you go back and drive the same place a few days later. There are now dozens of reasons why your testing protocol is no longer valid. For example, temperature. If you've seen the rock climbing movie, The Dawn Wall, you know that these climbers had to scale El Capitan and Yosemite in the winter so that the friction on their fingers was optimal. If you watch F1, you know how critical tire temperature is to traction. Other differences might be dust on the rocks, lighting, what you ate for breakfast. Plus, now you've practiced the line more times. Your testing needs to be done as close together as possible, alternating the mods back and forth to the original setting. Also, know that even top professionals in all disciplines have difficulty hitting the exact same line consistently. This is why ideally you would test blind, preferably double blind, where you don't know what settings have changed and seeing if you can reproduce the results not knowing which version you are driving. I assure you, it's a lot harder than you think. And then have at least one other driver confirm your results. It's a lot of work to demonstrate improvements and meet scientific rigor, and you should not let that take the fun out of it. Link risers don't hurt, but they certainly aren't helping. But if you think something makes you drive better and it boosts your confidence, don't let anyone talk you out of it.